Hello and welcome to another Raycastle video short. The aim of this presentation is to introduce the evolved packet core, have a look at the architecture and interfaces within the core network, and really just discuss how things have changed from its predecessors. But before I do that, I think uh, quite an important point to clarify is some of the terms and terminologies when it comes to LTE, because there is quite often a lot of confusion here. The term itself, LTE, as most people know, is long-term evolution. But when they talk about long-term evolution, they really are just talking about the long-term evolution of the radio access network. So this bit here, yeah, from the UE really to the edge of the core network, that is LTE. Yeah. When we look at the core network itself, yeah, we're looking or talking about an all IP core network called the EPC or Evolved Packet Core. Yeah. Sometimes you'll see people referring to SAE. Well, SAE is my system architecture evolution, and that's the EPC side. So LTE is long-term evolution of the radio access network. EPC is the long-term evolution, if you like, of the packet core. And one other term that you quite often hear is the EPS, the Evolved Packet System. Now, the EPS is your IP connectivity, which now extends all the way from the base station to the edge of my core network. So, LT is the radio part, EPC or SAE is the core network part, and that's really what we're going to have a look at today. Okay, so... Um, during earlier video shorts, we, we discussed how we've evolved and we've got rid of this um, uh, circuit switch domain. And really, we've just left uh, ourselves with an EU tran and an Evolve Packet Core. So it's this Evolve Packet Core that we're going to look at. Now, if you look at the Evolve Packet Core itself, functionally, there's only five nodes within the Evolve Packet Core. So we have a serving gateway. We have a PDN gateway. We've got a mobility management entity. We've got a home subscriber server. And then the final node we have is called the PCRF, or the Policy and Charging Resource Function. So we, we just to look at these nodes in um, individually, so we start with this first node here, the serving gateway. You know, there are many functions in the serving gateway, um, lawful interception, uh, differential services, code point marking. But really, the main function of that serving gateway is a mobility anchor. You know, the serving gateway will connect via an S1U interface to a number of Eno Bs, and then either S5 or S8 interface to a PDN gateway. Now, the, the difference between sort of S5 and S8, well, is not defined anywhere in standards other than if the serving gateway and the PDN gateway are in the same network, it's called S5. If the serving gateway and PDN gateway are in different networks, so for example, if I'm roaming, if I'm being provided with service by an EUTRAN, let's say in America, and I'm connected to services back in my home network, then they just call that S8. You know, the fact that we're going via an IP exchange here, GRX, whatever, isn't really defined in standards. So the serving gateway connects back to the PDN gateway via S5 or S8. So coming back to the serving gateway, a mobility anchor. You know, in this example, if, if I'm you know, connected back to a packet data network in my home network, every time I move from cell to cell, yeah, if we just had direct connectivity from the E no B to the PDN gateway, there's a whole range of international signaling there to redirect my connectivity to that, e, that new E no B. So, so really that serving gateway is there as a mobility anchor. Um, and that mobility can be EUTRAN. But in fact, there's no reason why, and it's defined in standards, that we can't either connect back to an SGSN via S4, or indeed directly back to an RNC via S12 using direct tunneling. So the serving gateways mobility functions are to anchor your connectivity, to anchor your EPS bearer to EUTRAN, but also as an anchor back to legacy technologies. So the next node we have is a PDN gateway. And again, that PDN gateway is it's almost identical to a GGSN. It's a gateway GPRS support node. So the main thing to point out about the PDN gateway 
is it houses the APN. And that APN is the access point name, which is effectively the IP address of the interface that you want to connect to, i.e. the packet data network that you're interested in. So we've got the serving gateway and the PDN gateway. Now, the next node we have here is a mobility management entity. And the mobility management entity will connect to serving gateways via the S11 interface. Um, and, and really, the, the main drive of this mobility management entity is to support NAS signaling. So inside the mobility management entity, we've got EMM, Enhanced Mobility Management, and ESM, Enhanced Session Management. So UEs will initially register onto a mobility management entity. The mobility management entity is going to deal with authentication and security. And once that's done, the mobility management entity is now going to use session management to drive the creation of bearers. So to access subscription information, we've now got the HSS. Again, the HSS was not new. It's, it's not a release 8 technology. You know, that, that actually arrived in release 4 um, as an evolution to the HLR. Uh, but release 8 standards define an S6A interface between MME and HSS based on the protocol diameter to uh, retrieve subscription information to do location updates. So your HSS is now your permanent store of subscription information. And really, the, the final node that we have in here is the PCRF, you know, the Policy and Charging Resource Function. You know, the interface here is S7 slash GX. And again, that really is there to manage policy, to uh, uh, to um, authorize quality of service for, for subscribers. And it'll probably get that information via the SP interface from the HSS. So, so just, just five functions within the core network. Mobility management entity, yeah, serving gateway, PDN gateway, HSS, and PCRF. And, and really, it's the function of these nodes specifically the MME, to drive the creation of and to support an EPS bearer yeah, which is going to carry IP traffic yeah, and support quality service. Now, if we just take a little step back and look at this, well, well why has it been done this way? Um, I suppose this serving gateway and this mobility management entity, if you were to look at the functions here, you know, these are really, in a GPRS network, the functions of an SGSN, a serving GPRS support node. And what they've tried to do here is, well, it's, it's really a next generation network concept. You know, the way the architecture for a network operator will, will look at some point is they lose pooling. And network operators will pool for resilience. So, for example, a, a, you know, a small to mid-sized operator, maybe a few million subscribers, may choose to put all of their architecture into a single pool. So, you'll have a number of MMEs within that pool, uh, realistically two, maybe three. Now, the network itself will consist of thousands, and in some cases tens of thousands, of ENOBs. And these ENOBs, each ENOB will have logical connections to all of the MMEs within an MME pool. So that's my sort of first introduction to resilience within the Evolve Packet Core. You know, if we have failure in an MME, we've got a backup. Now, assuming that the user has switched on for the very first time, you know, my user is going to switch on, establish a radio connection, to an ENO B. This ENO B, based on load balancing, is then going to attach that user to an MME. Now, part of the attach process, which is an EMM process, an enhanced mobility management process, yeah, encapsulated inside the EMM message when this user initially attaches, is an ESM message, a session management message, which may contain an APN. An access point name. So really there's two things that are going to happen now. Yeah, the MME can then use a DNS process 
to resolve the IP address and to load balance on an APN. So for example, at some point in the future, if, if, if you want to use a, a Vaulty service, you know, the starting point for Vaulty is the user is going to have to register onto an IMS. Now, if you're a larger network operator with tens of millions of subscribers, you're not going to have a single PDN gateway connected into your IMS because if it failed, you've lost your network. So we'd expect there to be multiple connections to the IMS. So this DNS process is going to resolve a PDN gateway to use based on the APN. So we've got resilience there. We've got resilience from an MME's perspective. We've pooled my MME's into an MME pool. All of my E and B's can access all of my MME's. We've got resilience when it comes to the PDN gateways. Yeah, we've got um, potentially multiple PDN gateways connected onto the same packet data network for resilience. Now, as far as the network itself is concerned, you know, the network itself is split up into tracking areas And the final node within that core, remember, was that serving gateway. And what you'll find that, again, for resilience, serving gateways will overlap and support multiple tracking areas. And indeed, when a user first registers, based on this user's location area identity, it's going to be a common practice to use a DNS function to resolve a uh, serving gateway for a subscriber that's going to minimize mobility and minimize um, serving gateway handovers. So we've got resilience when it comes to the serving gateways. We've got resilience when it comes to the MMEs. We've got resilience when it comes to the PDN gateways. The only place really where we don't have resilience is over the radio interface. Yeah, but that's uh, quite a small part of my network. So that concludes this short presentation. I hope it's been of some use. Um, if you want to learn more, please attend our EPC course. You can find details of this on our website, which is raycastle.com. And there you can also download uh, our LTE course portfolio. Thank you.